Well, church, we start a brand new series, Presence and Power, and I've got to be honest with you, I hadn't planned it for it to start on Pentecost Sunday. Genuinely, this is, I don't know whether I should admit this, because it's a bit embarrassing. Shall I admit it? Yes, Mark, we want to see you embarrassed. I was out with some friends this week, some Christian friends, they said, oh, isn't it amazing that it's Pentecost Sunday on Sunday? I was like, oh, is it? (laughs) Completely completely didn't realize, but hey, there you go. God knew it was Pentecost Sunday, thankfully, and he knew that we needed to spend time looking at all about his presence and power, which I'm very grateful for. Um, And we really do pick up a theme that I laid out last week, which uh, I asked the question, what are you reaching for? And you may recall that I had a very long piece of rope on this stage, and I said, this rope represents your life. And I said, not from there to there, but eternity. And at the end of the rope was this little, little colored piece. And I said, well, that's your life here on earth. And I said, we spend most of our time reaching for this little bit. If I can just get this, I can get that. And we completely forget about this. And we unpack the question of what does it mean to live life in the light of eternity? Because so many of us are focused on this world and reaching for this world that we have forgotten what it means to live in the light of eternity. And I, and I challenged us. And, I ch- and by the way, I was preaching to myself and I was grateful that you came along to listen. Um, but I said about how we say, we want to be a church like in the Church of Acts, don't we? We want to see the power and the miracles. And, um, and I said to you that oftentimes the, the conversation normally continues with, therefore, we need to do the same kind of thing. We need to have small house churches and we need to get rid of big churches. And I said, you know, the more I've been reflecting on that, the more I realize that's not the answer. The reason we don't see the same stuff happening as they did in the Church of Acts is because we're not the same people as the Church in Acts. It's not about the model, it's about the heart. These guys were sold out for Christ and they prioritized him and his kingdom before anything else. And they had such an awareness of living life in the light of eternity uh, that that's why it happened. And it's a challenge for me and for all of us to say, listen, what are are we doing here? (laughs) Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why am I Christian, you know? What am I, what's what's the point? What's the point of meeting? What's the point of praying? I tell you what the point is, is to experience his goodness, to worship him and to extend his kingdom. Because while we're on that little bit of that rope, we're on a mission. And I said that you are gonna be rewarded for your time here on earth, did you know that? You will be rewarded, you will come to the judgment seat of Christ and we looked at that, the beamer seat of Christ. And you won't be judged whether or not you're saved because I looked at that and said you're saved by faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. But your works in the body, whether good or bad, will be judged by the king of the universe and we will be rewarded for that. And I don't know about you, but I want that to be a good experience for me, quite frankly. And you say, well, Mark, that's not great. You're motivated by rewards. Well, can I just quote the apostle Paul? I run the race with the prize set forth before me. I mean, you know, there are those. So I just want to challenge us to say, what is our focus? What, what, are we, what are we reaching for? What are we stretching for? What are we busting a gut for? And really, presence and power, folks, continues on that theme because it's a thread that we've through that we'll see. Because we need to understand the presence of God and the power of God. We do need to understand the context within which we look at it. You know, when we talk about the power, presence and power of God, we are not talking about some kind of force that we summon to give us special powers. You know, I think that we can err in much danger, especially us charismatics and Pentecostals, is like, we need the power of God. That's my Avengers move. Do you like that? I need the power. Where is your presence? I'll carry on. I'll stop. But you know, it's not in that context. It's not some force that we call upon when we need some power. The presence of God and the power of God has to be seen through the lens of his love for us and our desire for him. It has to be. That's what it's all about. In fact, I would go as far as to say you can only fully comprehend the presence and power of God to the degree that we are able, by the way, through this understanding that it is out of relationship. I'd like to quote you um, from A.W. Tozer. Some of you will know A.W. Tozer, a great pastor and theologian in the um, 20th century, and he's wrote many books 
But in his book, Experience in the Presence of God, I'd like to read this excerpt. Within every human breast rages this desire driving him forward. Many a person confuses the object of that desire and spends his or her entire life striving for the unobtainable. Very simply put, the great passion in the heart of every human being who are created in the image of God is to experience the awesome majesty of God's presence. The highest accomplishment of humanity is entering the overwhelming presence of God. The highest accomplishment of humanity is not your accolades, it is not your career, it is not the materials that you amass, it is not the awards that you put on your wall. The highest accomplishment of humanity is entering the overwhelming presence of God. Nothing else can satiate this burning thirst. You see, his presence is about our desire for him. And we have to start from that basis. Does anyone else identify with this thirst, this hunger? Does anyone else identify that there are moments, and I talked about it in my own life last week, where we pursue certain things because we feel that desire, and then when we taste it, we find that actually it doesn't satisfy us. You see, there exists within us a burning desire for something other than there is this sense that we have been created for someone else and somewhere else. Think about that. Because of the fallen world that we live in, we have been created for somewhere else to be in his presence. I'd like to quote again from Brother Lawrence. Now, Brother Lawrence was a, a, a monk. Some of you will know his very famous book, Practice the Presence of God. And uh, I would like to read this. He says, I cannot imagine... By the way, this is ye old English. It's, this has been updated, but it's still a bit old. I cannot imagine how religious persons, that's you and I, can live satisfied without the practice of the presence of God. For my part, I keep myself retired with him in the depth of center of my soul as much as I can. And while I am so with him, I fear nothing. But the least turning from him is unsupportable. You see, what he's saying here is that there's an inclination of our heart, even when you're busy, even when you're doing things, that is warming to him and his presence. Because we have been created to be in relationship and communion with him. Now, this talk, by the way, is going to be the start of a number of weeks. We've got some amazing um, speakers that are going to be speak, speaking prophetically into um, this subject. And so the objective for me this morning is really to lay a foundation about the presence, and next week I'll unpack the power. And that's why I'm going to be laboring the point, because it's an important point for us to get about relationship with him. Now, what do we mean by the presence of God? Let's just unpack this together. When talking about the presence of God, we typically talk about it in two main ways. The first way is the truth that his presence is with us all of the time and everywhere. His presence is with us all of the time and everywhere. And we call that... His omnipresence. Some of you may have heard that term. Omni means multi-presence, and presence means presence. It's not presence with a T. Although it is a present, it is a gift for us, his presence. Very good, Mark. Well done. Um, thank you, brother. Um, but that is one of his attributes, is his omnipresence. Let's read together. Let's get into some scripture. Psalm 139, 7 to 12. It's going to be on the screen if you're in the room. If you're online, it'll be on your device. This is what the, um, the psalmist wrote. This is the psalm of David. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your? If I ascend to heaven, you are. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day. The darkness is as light with you. 
You see, the psalmist understood the reality that God is everywhere and there are many other scriptures that talk about the reality of God's presence in all things. In other words, he is here even if you don't recognize his presence. You can't go any further away from his presence. You can't go any closer to his presence. Let me give you a a picture to help explain this. It's like the air that we breathe. This is not a perfect example, but hopefully it will help put a picture to it. You cannot see the air that you breathe. The H2O, H2O, can you? That's water. (laughs) I just realized, yeah. I looked at my glass, clearly. And I thought, oh, I could do with a sip of water. <clears throat> you cannot see the oxygen <clears throat> in the air, can you? And yet it is there. If you run outside, there won't be any more of it than there is in here. It might smell different, but you know, the oxygen is there, as is God's presence. It is everywhere. <laughs> and so the comfort we have is that we don't have to listen closely. Please hear hear this. We don't have to rely on our experience to know the truth that God is with us in all things. And don't you know sometimes as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death that it's like he's not there, but the truth is his rod and his staff, they do come for us. So that is his presence. But there is a secondary way in which we talk about his presence. And I think this is typically... As, definitely as charismatics and Pentecostals, we normally refer to his presence. It is his manifest presence. What does that mean? It means God's manifest presence is his prev- presence made manifest. That's not very helpful, Mark. You've just changed the words around. Maybe you should unpack that. That's a good idea. It, his presence revealed to us and experienced by us. I'll say that again. His manifest presence is his presence revealed to us and experienced by us. Sometimes people call this type of presence a relational presence or experiential presence. And so the manifest presence of God is when he reveals himself in a unique and clear way to us. Let me explain it this way. Let me continue with the air. The air represents the omnipresence of God, but there's sometimes when the wind kicks up and what do you do? You feel it. That's the manifest presence of the air. And there are these moments when we become aware of his presence with our senses. We are aware of his presence in a unique, unique way. You know, when we experience the manifest presence of God, we find that our hearts and minds are impacted, and it has always, the presence of God has a transformational power, which we're gonna look at in a moment. The manifest presence of God has a transformational power. I can recall a time, I was about 14 or 15, I grew up in a Baptist church, and, I remember I was on my own in one of the youth rooms. I don't know why I was there on my own. These days with safeguarding, that would not be possible. And uh, I was just waiting for the meet to start, I guess, or something or other, and there were some Bibles on 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 the wall. And I remember trying to get my head around John, the start, John chapter one. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh. And I was like, what? And uh, I remember all of a sudden, there was just this awareness of the presence of God and I just started laughing, just laughing. There was no one around. It wasn't like there was lots of people laughing and I was laughed and I laughed and I laughed. It was a beautiful thing. There was just this sense of joy, this sense of wonder. You know, the psalmist said in 1611, chapter 16, verse 11, in your presence is fullness of? Boy, some of us, we just need some joy, hey? Oh, Lord Jesus, we just pray for a manifest presence in this place right now. And we need your joy, Lord. 
But you see, whenever he manifests his presence, when we are aware of his presence, there's joy. Maybe, maybe you can recall, you'll say, you know, I remember, now you'd come to mention it, Mark. I remember this time I was very anxious and all of a sudden it was like God was with me. Couldn't describe it. I just had this peace. Like I, just, I just had this sense that everything was gonna be Okay, have you, anyone felt that? That's his manifest presence, the transformational presence of God. Or maybe you've been working through an issue and you're like, Lord, how do I deal with this relational problem that I have? Because I'm so angry with them. I'm so upset by them. Would help me know how to speak with them. And all of a sudden, you can't describe it. But there's almost like this love that you have for them. What's that? The manifest presence of God. I could go on. But I know that as I speak, for those of you who are believers, some of you have got your own stories. I was speaking with a lady last week. And... Um, <clears throat> She's a fairly new Christian, and she said, I've, I came to Space for the first time two Tuesdays ago. Space is our monthly uh, prayer, worship, and flag waving. I love a flag wave. And prophetic art, hour and a half. You should come along. And she came for the first time, and <clears throat> she shared this testimony. She said, I couldn't believe what was happening. I sat down on one of the bean bags. It's in the youth auditorium, there are bean bags. And I had my hands out. And I couldn't believe it. It was like someone was holding my hands. And I said, God, is that you? I said, yes. I said, please don't leave me. And he said, I'm always with you. In that moment, for the first time, for the first time in her life, she experienced the reality of the presence of God. And it changed her. And it changes us when we hear it. the manifest presence of God. And it comes out of relationship, our desire to be with him. We read throughout scriptures, stories of men and women experiencing the manifest presence of God, don't we? From, the Mo, from Moses at the burning bush to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the raging fire. From Jacob wrestling with God saying, I, I'm not gonna let you go until you bless me. To other men and women who experience God. But today is Pentecost Sunday. Happy birthday again. And therein lies a wonderful New Testament story of a bunch of believers in Jesus experiencing his manifest presence and power of God. Should we read that together? It's in Acts. Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> 1 to 4, it'll be on the screen. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What's going on here? <clears throat> Well, first we need to understand that each believer has the indwelling spirit in them, okay? It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your bodies are a temple of what? The Holy Spirit, whom you have received from God. The moment we become a Christian, we have the spirit of adoption that enables us to cry out, cry out Abba, Father, as the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans. And so you have, if you're a believer, the indwelling spirit of God in you. Why? Because you're a new creation. You've been adopted into the family. But the indwelling of the Spirit is not the same as the Spirit's manifest presence. I'll put it another way. There is a difference between the Spirit in us and upon us. There is a difference between the Spirit in us and upon us. When we talk about the Spirit being upon us, we're talking about the manifest presence of God made known to us by the work and the mission, ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you read in the book of Acts, there were a time when um, the apostles were in front of um, some of the officials of the day, and it says that the Spirit of God came upon them and they were able to speak with courage and boldness. That was a manifest presence of God. Are you following me? 
it's worth saying as we unpack the difference between his omnipresence and his manifest presence that God was present in the whole of Israel, but in that very moment, as we've just read, his manifest presence was just in that place. And his presence came, what? As a rushing wind experienced by them. It came as tongues of fire experienced by them. And what was the result of this? It was the transformational power to extend the kingdom of Jesus Christ and making him known and his majesty known. And what happened? The church was birthed and 3,000 on that day became believers. That was the transformational power of the manifest presence of God. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to end this talk. I've got a bunch of words in front of me, of which I'm not sure which ones to read. <clears throat> read them all. Thank you. Um, as I try and wrap this up, I want to look at this from another angle. We've looked at the presence of God rooted in our desire and thirst for his presence. But the other dynamic and angle is this, that his manifest presence is a result of his desire to be with us. We're not begging God to show his face because we really need him. We're drawing near to a God that wants to draw near to us. I mean, the whole redemptive story is about essentially his presence with us. In the Garden of Eden, God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the afternoon. We read that. That was how we were created to be. We were created to worship him and to enjoy him forever. He created us because he wanted relationship with us. And then sin came in. Sin became a barrier between a holy God and us. And what happened? We were what? We had to leave his What did God do? Did he say, well, sucks to be a human, unlucky. <laughs> say, I'm going to wipe you out and create another bunch of humans and try again. No, he enacted his redemption plan. Not, God was not caught off guard. He knew this would be the case. And so what did he do? He set up a sacrificial system in order that they could be cleansed of their sins and the priests would would be able to go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was and where was the Ark was his presence. But you see that covenant was never going to be the final solution. What that covenant was about as we read in what Paul said was that it showed us the need for transformation in our heart because it was the, God gave the law to say this is what I require but not the power within to be able to follow that. It's like, you know, if you walk past a, a beautifully manicured lawn and there's a sign that says, don't walk on this grass, you're like, oh, I really wouldn't mind walking on that grass. <laughs> it's like the law, really, you know. And so what God said is, you know, I want to demonstrate your need for transformational power. And so Jesus came along. Jesus incarnate, God incarnate, made flesh, fully God, fully man, why? Because he wanted to presence himself with us. Emmanuel, God with us. And he made a plan. And so what happened then? At the end, Jesus died on the cross. His mission was accomplished. He had bore the sin of the world and, and uh, taken on you and your sin and my sin. And, and that meant he paid the penalty that was due you and I. This is the gospel message. And then not only that, but his righteousness, his fulfillment of the law was placed upon us. And so when God looks at us, he looks at us as holy and we're able to run into the presence of God with boldness and courage. And then what did he say? Well, the, the, the disciple, he says, right, I've got to leave you now. And they're like, what? We were just getting used to your presence. You're with us again. He says, I've got some good news. God the Father's going to send the Holy Spirit to be with you. And you see, the life of Christ, the presence of God is with us through the Holy Spirit with us in this church age. Why? Because it's part of this redemptive arc of God wanting to presence himself. But it doesn't end there, does it? Oh no, we've got some good news coming. 
Because at the end of this period of time, when Jesus comes again, and we looked at that last week, if you missed that, then do catch up. Eventually, after the millennial reign of Christ, there'll be a new heaven, there'll be a new earth, and we will live with him for eternity. And therein is the end of that redemptive arc that we're currently in. Why? Because God wants to presence himself with us. When we talk about the presence of God, let us not fall into the trap that we're just calling upon some force that we can use. Let us recognize and remember that we were created for his presence. It says, as I end, Hebrews 10, 19, 22, it says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, through his flesh, what happened when Jesus says, it is finished, that temple that I mentioned before, the holy of holies, that, that veil that was there between man and God and the presence of God, what happened? It was torn in two, signifying that we could enter boldly into his presence because of the sacrificial blood of Christ and the breaking through his flesh. And it goes on to say, and since we have great priests over the house of God, that means that Jesus is our high priest interceding for us. Let us draw near with what? A true heart in full assurance of faith, where the heart sprinkled clean from any evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Our greatest spiritual need is to go beyond the omnipresence of God and into his manifest presence. Is anyone with me? Anyone feel that stirring? I've got to say, I am so not qualified to talk on this today. But then probably no one is. But I tell you what I can give you a little bit. I can share with you a bit of a hunger that I've got. It's not as deep as I wish it to be. That thirst isn't as much as I hope it would be. But are, you, are we thirsting for him? Are we just wanting to put time aside and bask in his presence and experience his manifest presence? And we have to wait. It's not like, yeah, I'm ready for your manifest presence, Lord, go for it, bang. It's about relationship. Imagine if you just had friends that just came to you when they wanted something. Okay, I'm going, let's go for it. What kind of friendship's that? What kind of relationship's that? God the Father is wooing us and he's stirring in our hearts a desire for him. And it says in James that as we draw near to him, what? He draws near to us. Feel a burden as your pastor because I'm not here to give a good show. I'm not here to have flash words and funny jokes. I'm here to lead you as the flock that God has entrusted to me into the presence of the living God and the weight of that, the burden of that, the love that I have for you, whether you're online or in the room, that you would experience God, that you would know what it means to say, I know Him, that I taste and see that He is good. I don't want you leaving this place and saying, wasn't that a great talk? And living your lives the same. How can we hear the Word of God and not be changed? This world will tell you that the world is enough. This world will tell you that you prioritize God outside of every, after everything else. This world will tell you to slot God in when you can make it happen. I don't read that in the Bible. And I'm sorry if you're offended by that. But you know, as Wimber used to say, God often offends the mind to reveal the heart. And I want us to pray, so let us stand.